Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Norsken House here in Stockholm and to Nordic Climate Action Weeks, day six. We are very, very excited to uh, welcome you to one uh, recording of and uh, the second, actually, uh, Nordic Talks session. And we have some very, very distinguished uh, guests here with us in Stockholm today. But before we start, I'd like to remind you of the fact that you, we want you to be active on social media. So please remember that we have a hashtag that's uh, Nordic Climate Action. Use it, comment, and be very, very active on, on social media. Uh, we are following what you say, and we hope that you say a lot. But without further delay, I will give the word over to Sara, Sara Bru, who will be the moderator of this discussion. Sara. Thank you. Welcome to this uh, Nordic talk where we will uh, explore if climate change is changing parenthood. <laughs> and uh, welcome to all three of you. You work in very, uh, three very different areas, but uh, you all have uh, two important things in common. That's why you're here. Uh, we're actually all four of us parents, and uh, and we all uh, work for uh, we all care about acting for a more sustainable world. Uh, Terry, welcome to you uh, from Oslo. You are the father of three kids, and uh, you're a professional snowboarder and entrepreneur, and passionate about clean living. When did you become a climate activist? Uh, well, I've never been a climate activist. That's just a label that people put on me. Like, people call me a snowboarder too, but I have a lot of labels, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm a parent too. And uh, I just think uh, I'm from a small place in Norway where it's very clean and uh, the woods of Telemark. And when I started traveling the world when I was 15, I just saw the, you know, all the smog in the big cities in South America and San Francisco. I saw all the people, all the cars. Uh, I tasted water in the States that tasted like swimming pool water. And uh, I met some great people that took me into health food stores when I was really young. And I think through food and stuff, I've been kind of important. Like, that's where I caught my interest for like clean living and very logical that what I want to put in my body, even though I drink alcohol sometimes. <laughs> but, uh, so it's just. It's like a big circle, and uh, I think when you travel too, you see it more, how really bad it is. Okay, do you remember like a specific situation where you were like, okay, I have to do something myself? Well, uh, not like I have to do something myself, but um, I think I've just been personally aware of it. Um, like, I remember being in the uh, top of the mountains in uh, Chile and looking down to Santiago. Santiago is, you can say it's, it's almost like a third world city at that time, at least early 90s. And it was just black smog climbing up the mountains, almost all the way up to three, 4,000, you know. And uh, same thing with San Francisco uh, and all like the big places. And um, like I've, a lot of people go, how far back have you been like thinking about it? And a story is like, uh, I found an old autograph card, and the question was um, if it hurt my credit card when I went shopping. And my answer was it hurt the environment. And that was, I think I was 17 or 18 at that time, so I think it made me impact. And who, also the people I was with, you know, because some guys chased to, you know, do more partying, and other guys were more like, uh, we call them in Norway, friskus. In America, mm -hmm. they're called granola bars. <laughs> But, uh, you know, they, they try to eat good and be really active and you live more with nature. Okay. And then I think everything that is around that will just fall into place, I think. So how do you do something about it today? How do you, like, work for clean, clean living? <laughs> well, I fly around sure. the world and get a lot of waves. Yeah? <laughs> <No>. Very <laughs> uh, clean. Well, yeah. So you can arrest me in uh, many things, you know. I do a lot of, like, not sustainable things at all. but. I can influence my sponsors, and I have, and we do. I'm really proud of what my sponsors do. Uh, and I do all the stuff for the home, home things. Um, I had an electric car in 99. Um, <clears throat> I tried to recycle everything I can. And, but uh, it's tough because the system is not really easy uh, 
for recycling. We in Oslo, we just starting like recycling really properly or better in this five years ago. Okay. And then in Telemark, where my parents live, they started way earlier. Okay. So it's and then you go to another country where they don't care. You know, you have all these like things like, well, it doesn't matter if we do it and they don't. So it's uh, I don't know, it's a tough call these days. I have to say. <laughs> Good that you're honest about your flying around the world all the time, but don't too shy about admitting it. Did you did you consider to take the train around with you? Well, I should have taken the train here, but I actually flew here too. Mm. <laughs> it's like five hours, but uh, mm. I thought about it a little too late. I should have done that. I could have done it. Um, but I think you know it's more important just like the flying around. I think you know it's we can be role models or activists or whatever, but it really comes down to the politician and. Maybe the people, the consumer power has a lot, and the consumer power and who we vote for, uh, I think, has a lot to say with it. Thanks. And I welcome to you. You're head of uh, sustainability at H&M Group. You're also the mother of two kids. Uh, can you, <coughs> is there a specific, a specific moment when, where you remember that you became a climate activist? Um. Well, I mean, this goes way back when I was around 10 or 12, I think. So I also come from a small place, not in Norway, but in Sweden. I called Östersund, so it's in the middle of Sweden. <clears throat> really beautiful, like big lake, and you got the mountains and the forests and all of that. And that was kind of the world that I knew for a really long time. And then when I was around, I think, 12, I, I became really aware of how other places in the world looked like, and that that was quite far from the world that I used to grow up in. And I remember especially being going out hiking. We were up in the mountains, and I saw this really beautiful crystal lake and realized that this is not what most lakes look like. So I went home, and then I wrote a letter to the prime minister and to the environmental minister, and just, I mean, basically... <laughs> asking that all um, rivers or all lakes should look like that. Of course, I was not so aware about the political system at that time, so I thought that was going to be enough. Of course not. Um, <laughs> but, but did, I you, think did you get a response? Did they write I you did, back? Yeah? I did, actually, uh, from both of them, and also a lot of environmental brochures about what the, they were doing about it. So, okay. um, But I think that that was somewhere where I felt both that I got the interest for environment specifically, but also that I knew that I wanted to work with that in the future. And then much later on, um, when I was finished studying, I was thinking, where can I work to make the most impact? And I mean, as you say, Terry, I think the political area is one, super important. That's where we set the rules and uh, the, the game plan, so to say. Uh, but then I also did an internship at the UN where we worked a lot with companies who were involved in development work. And I realized that companies are actually the ones that also, to some extent, hold more power than what some countries or politicians do. So that's why I decided to work for a company with sustainability to really create, um, yeah, be part of creating impact. If you should name or say one specific thing that you <coughs> feel is like your, your biggest, biggest achievement in your work so far, could you say like one thing? Well, I mean, it is climate. I mean, it's the mm. thing that I wake up and think about yeah. every single day. And I think, I mean, looking at the fashion industry, it's one of the dirtiest industries today, representing around, uh, yeah, it's the second most dirtiest industry. So we have a huge journey to do. Uh, looking ahead, we know we cannot consume fashion the way we do today. We cannot produce fashion the way we do today either. So the whole system needs to change. <laughs> Uh, and at the foundation of that is, of course, moving to like a more circular economy and all of that. But of course, climate is of essence. Uh, and the world needs to be climate neutral by 2050. So we set the goal that we should be climate positive by 2040 in our whole value chain. So that's from the cotton farm all the way to the customer's washing machines. Huge journey Is, is to it too do. ambitious? N n it can't be. I mean, mm. we just have to. Mm. I think that's the only way to do mm. it. Uh, so, I mean, it is not me setting that goal. It's the whole company, and that, of course, okay. involves the whole industry. But, I mean, looking back, I hope that I can see that as, I mean, you're talking about kids. This is really what I want to tell my kids that I was part of. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Lena, welcome to you too. You're the mother of uh, how many kids? Uh, two, two of your of own. my own, and three bonus. Yeah, three bonus kids, mm -hmm. and you're one of Sweden's most successful and uh, beloved actresses. And furthermore, you're also a Greenpeace ambassador. When did you realize that you had to take some action? 
Um, well, let's say, I think this was about 2000 and maybe six or seven. Uh, there was in Telberg, up in Dalarna in Sweden, um, a huge um, congress. They invited 600 climate scientists for the first time. They were re presenting a report um, about... Uh, I was supposed to, to read poems we're together with Thomas Tranström, a very famous Swedish poet that still was alive. He was playing the piano with his left hand because he was had a stroke, and, uh, and Barbara Hendricks was singing. We were supposed to like entertain with poems and singing during this week. And when they presented this report, uh, 600 climate Scientologists from all over the world came to the same conclusion, and they didn't uh, in, in, uh, think about the poles. They took that out of the, the, the whole report, because if the North Pole and South Pole was in uh, these figures, it, it would crash. It would crash because it was already then going so fast on the poles. And what they were saying, it was like, I, I had heard um, Al Gore talking before that, and you know, but it was then it, it hit me so hard what was going to happen. And, uh, I mean, it's the same thing every year now. Um, the IPPC, the, the report, uh, with the reports per million, and we are already, we cannot uh, go over, like, was it 250 then? Or now we, we are, like, way ahead. And it's like, it, it should be, it's, we're already in the catastrophe. So, and then a, f a few years later, uh, the Greenpeace asked if I wanted to be a Greenpeace uh, peace ambassador. And um, I, I just have to uh, ask you, what did mm. you feel when you when you were at that uh, in 2000, 2006? Yeah. And you, what what did you do after that? Did you get shocked? I, I, or did I, you do I, anything? I, no, I really got like shocked and uh, uh, enlightened, you know, yeah. uh, about what how how to listen to these scientists. It yeah. was like, okay, it's just what Greta Thunberg is talking about today. Don't give a shit about me. Listen to the scientists. Like, take some action in, uh, of what they are saying, you know, because that's... Uh, and you can feel so depressed sometimes, and I understand young people that, like we were talking before here, that they are kind of... Oh, they, they get really kind of uh, panic and catatonic, you know, in the... Uh, what can you do? It's uh, Everything is going down. So, and then, that, I mean, I must say I'm so impressed and proud of all these millions of young people that are demonstrating and uh, around the world uh, that this little Greta started. It's, it's fantastic. It's going to be in, like a new generation where the, you can't look back from this point. And then I was um, supposed to be on a Greenpeace ship some years ago, if you remember the Arctic 30. The Russians took uh, the Greenpeace ship with all the people on board, put in jail in Russia. I was supposed to board that ship after four days. So I kind of thought, OK, it's not going to happen. I'm very glad I wasn't on the ship uh, to do a small documentary about mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bjorn, a place south of Svalbard. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah. And, um, and then I was talking to this uh, campaigner on Greenpeace, what shall I do? What shall we do? Wait, now it's like the, the Arctic Council, that is the foreign ministers for all Arctic eight countries. They had a meeting in Kiruna that year. Uh, this is seven years ago now. And uh, you want to go up there and interview them and maybe like just to, 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 to learn? So I went to Kiruna and they gathered all these indigenous people for two days ahead of the Arctic Council meeting. And to hear their stories from uh, Samis in um, Russia and Sweden and the, the Inuits on Greenland and, and the, uh, like indigenous people in Canada with the Indians, how they were already suffering from the change in climate and nature in their countries up north. It was so terrible to hear. So I, like, I came back and said, I, now I really have to do something. So I started, I talked to this uh, film producer, and we said, we got to do something. What, how do we get out, like, widest? And maybe we should do a, a, 
movie or a TV series. So now, six years later, it's coming in February now. So yeah. we, we produce one. It's about the Arctic Council, and it's about in, Arc in, in the north, uh, in Greenland. It's, it's a place there. And um, about climate, politics, and what is happening, and what is happening now when the ice is melting and the more and more people want to, to look for oil and gas and the, all this. It's quite terrible what is happening up in the north right now, how people want to explore. So nice from of you. People from all over the world, companies from all over. Mm. But uh, thank you all of you mm. for being here today. It's so nice of you. Uh, and we have to talk a little bit about how uh, uh, the climate change is changing parenthood, if you think that. Uh, I will just start to ask mm -hmm. you, um, uh, both, of course, in the big picture with greater and everything, but also in your, in your life, uh, did any of you experience uh, your kids uh, asking uh, you questions? about uh, climate and maybe asking you to take more responsibility than you do? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> My daughter works in Greenpeace, so okay. she's, she picks on me every time I fly. I feel so bad. And like, <laughs> you know, and she's right, you know, but I, I also guess that um, you can change that. I mean, I, th I, I, I have a very hard time to see. Ev maybe we have to reverse it and live in a completely different way, which I think we have to do in the long run. But also that uh, mankind, we, we invent things. I, I'm sure that we can invent absolutely fossil-free uh, ways to, to travel around and to... Uh, or or the, the globe will be small again and we stay in our small communities. I don't know. Either way. Either way. Yeah. But uh, besides uh, uh, picking on, on you, on pick mm. on you for mm. flying, did, did she did she do that her whole life, or is it just now when she works? No, in last Greenpeace? ten years. Last, last ten, ten years. years okay. I'd say. Okay. okay. What about Both you, Anna? Of them. Mm -hmm. you, how old are your kids? Yeah, well, they're a bit smaller. They're mm. five and nine. But I think, I mean, they are part of a generation that grows grows up knowing nothing uh, but this. I mean, this is what they, what is the new normal to them. Mm. I am old enough to have seen that change, but for them, I mean, climate change, uh, terrorism, all of those are concepts that is part of the world that is the one that they really know. Um, and I mean, I think it's, uh, I do think it's fantastic to see that they grew up already now being more clever and more aware than what we are. Uh, I told you that story mm. before, but my, my oldest one, Arvid, when he was, I think four, he was in the car with my dad and with my husband. And then he asked my husband, so, well, dad, why do you want to destroy the planet? And he said, well, I don't want to destroy the planet. Who wants to do that? And then he said, well, why don't you buy an electric car? So already at the age of four, he was so aware of what needed to be done. He knew about carbon emissions. He knew about electric vehicles. And now we have an electric car, so I mean, we did mm. as he said. <laughs> but, uh, but I think it says something about the level of knowledge that our kids will have and what will impact all the choices they will do based on that, which I think is great. Um, I mean, from a parent perspective, I think that the most important thing, in, and I'm, I'm thinking about what you said, Eliana, because I think on the one hand, you can become so paralyzed looking at what's happening in the future and how you, as a kid, is going to take that on. I have a friend who has, her husband is a teacher for, uh, what do you call, Mellanstadie, mm. like, uh, yeah, kids 12, 13, 14. Mm. Uh, and they have, I mean, crisis groups for kids who are so depressed around the climate. And I think that also creates a lot of, you know, you become passive and you feel that there's nothing you can do. So I think the same time as you need to create the awareness of what the world actually looks like, you also need to find ways of creating hope, because I think that is also what we spur the innovations and the new solutions that we need to have, uh, because all of this needs to be mobilized into action. Also, Terry, you told me also your kids, eh, they didn't demand any any more sustainable lifestyle from you because you're already like picking on them. But you said uh, also, y your son, you tried to show him a TV show. 
Yeah, just watching uh, Our Planet that is mm. going on Netflix is kind of based on the 10 last years. And that's really depressing for him. It's de mm. depressing for us. First, you see all these beautiful nature shots, and then you get the message in every, every episode. And, uh, you know, speaking about like the system and and how many, like you said too, like having the depressions, there's just so much information. Like, and we're and just another group here talking about it. Mm. You know, we were one guy said on the show, like, why do we spend billions of just talking about it and not coming up with solutions? So I would rather talk about like what solutions and push the people who can actually make the solutions. Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, rather than just speaking about the problems, because the problems has been there since the 80s. Really, yeah. they've been speaking about it for a long time. <laughs> but I think it, it is like a new situation. My kids are like uh, nine and eleven, and my son at eleven. He he. This last two years, he comes home from school and says stuff like, "Okay, mom, can we not drink cow milk anymore? Can we just can you just buy like different kind of milk types so we can drink something else?" And then the next week it will be like, "Oh, can we?" Uh, can we try to live a vegetarian for one week so I can try it and see what it's about? And uh, can we only eat meat for once a week and stuff like that? It's like something that is in their uh, yeah, school day and they talk about it, all the kids. And I think that's a pretty new thing. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he thinks that way. Yeah, but, I'm, but like, I think it's But really I'm also concerned, w what is it? It's it I think every little thing helps. Mm. And even like as a snowboarder in the small industry, my impact is zero, zero percent, you know, mm. in a way. But then, for example, I talked to this woman that lived down in Indonesia, and they were going around to school teaching kids about recycling, whatever, and they wanted to tell their parents. But they, all the kids like, we can't tell our parents what to do. That's not in our religion or in our culture. We're not allowed to do that. So, no, no. so you have all those other problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You have, but, but I mean, do you experience that, that there is like a new, do, do, how do you feel about the kids are telling you when they do, telling you <laughs> to do stuff differently? Is that? I mean, my kids are grown up now. Yeah. So, so of course I learn stuff from them all yeah. the time, every yeah. day, because they are, I think they are smart. <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's of course. I think it's it's very important not to get depressed or paralyzed and not do anything because you can do a lot of things, small things, and every little thing you do, every p person you talk to, and say, do you do you really do we really need this and this? I mean, I think that is good because together, I think we can come. People just don't sit down and let themselves die. Mm -hmm. For just like that, we we are going to, to. But, but I mean, but can you understand that young people be, be, be it's going to be like, oh, I'm not going to hear about this again. I can This is too yeah. much. I'm getting too depressed. It's I, ruining my I, life. I I, I absolutely mm. understand because they are, uh, look at uh, all the, the grown-ups. Uh, look at all mm. these other generations. They they don't give a shit. They haven't been for for doing that for how long? A uh, hundred years. So they just we have to understand this is a economical political. A uh, severe question to to put to governments who we vote for. Uh, we can do this and this much, but the, the the big picture to really change that we have to uh, demand from from companies and governments. I think. You have a question? Yeah. Question, Jonas. Yeah, sure. He's on, right? Yeah. Hi, my name is Jonas. I'm from Denmark. I am um, through my some of my work. I travel around Denmark in schools or public places and talk about the SDGs and, and the climate change. Uh, it's easier always to capture the attention of the youth and, of course, also the parents quite often. One of the uh, challenges I see is that in schools in the more rural places in Denmark, as you might be able to call them, they are talking about well, they don't really understand their kids and uh, they also a bit angry that you know the kids in Copenhagen with their SDG focused schools and curriculums and all that there's a you know way more than we do we, we can't do anything to help our our kids but of course the kids they are just like well we know what it's about we've read about it online or social media or our friends so we know what's about let's let's facilitate some change here in our own homes so to me it seems more that the the you know the um, the, the gap is more between generations that is about uh, s schools or kids even or about about uh, and about uh, geography. Do you have any um, you know comment on that? What can the, what can your generation do to facilitate our will to be ambitious? 
That's a very good question, I think, because it is our generation and, and the politicians and the companies. And I, uh, you can understand the millions of y kids that are protesting every week. Uh, why don't you do anything? Why don't we do anything? I, 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 I yeah, try what, to what talk and do as much question. as I can, but yeah. I mean, it's only so much as a, as an, I, I'm an actress. So, what, I mean, I try to do what I can, but I mean, it's uh, we should, we should uh, be really angry with our governments and our companies and that is doing it. I, in fact, Greenpeace uh, sued the state of Norway a couple of years ago. <laughs> Remember that? Do you, did you hear uh, about that? We that sued. sounds good, um, It's uh, the best, uh, <laughs> best, uh, best, uh, best, uh, best uh, the older, gener the, uh, very old generation and Greenpeace together sued the Norwegian state for like, was it article 112 or 12? I don't remember now. Because they, it's in the constitution that the government should uh, take care of nature and keep it nice and clean for coming futures, generation, future generations. And because of the oil company and the that oil, they don't do that. So it's kind of that article, they still, of course, we knew we w weren't going to win. But still, <laughs> it's, uh, I think it's up again. You know, because uh, I think that, and it's also this American guy that sued, uh, sued the American state for climate uh, pollution. And I mean, maybe more and more these uh, a little more anarchistic ways of uh, doing things to, to alert the situation is good, I think. But I mean, I think coming back to your question there as well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I think you're perfectly right that the, the, the generational shift in attitudes can be seen in climate, but also in many other more political areas as well. And I think there's a disconnect between those generations, maybe also a sense of guilt that you as an older generation were part of creating this, which the young gener generation now have to clean up. But I can also see a different sense of uh, empowerment among the young generations, which are now taking to the streets, for example. And I think, I mean, in a few years, they will get to vote. Uh, they will get to be part of shaping their future in a much bigger way than the, what they can today. And I think they will reach a critical mass of influence from a new generation that will, I think, uh, bring out a whole new agenda. So I, I think it comes with a power that we have just seen the beginning of right now. But yeah. that, is, that, that is what Greta Thunberg, exactly what she's saying. Mm. Yeah, oh, thank you so much. You, you are our hope, the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. And it can go on like that, and nothing changes meanwhile, because then comes the next generation, and they will be, uh, get uh, jobs in the big companies that are still polluting this, the planet. So it's, it's, going, it's like a wheel, you know, it would never stop, because these big this, companies... This system doesn't work. Huh? The system doesn't work. The system doesn't work. That's what I feel too, because it's these big companies are, in many times, as you said, more powerful than states. So they're not going to step back. Oh God, we are polluting the air, the planet. We, let's not. Let's not. Wait, let's but stop I, making profit. No, but I think they will. I mean, you I think, think so? yes, mm -hmm. definitely. I mean, coming yes. from a big company, yeah, yeah, knowing yeah, that, that we are mm. part of the problem, I mean, mm. I can really see a change when it comes to, uh, we were talking about that before, the consumer power. I mean, uh -huh. we know that regardless of the customers, if we're going to exist as an industry or as a company, not in the next three years, but in the mm -hmm. next 30s, we have to address this. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we will not have a planet to be on. Mm -hmm. So it is really in our interest for survival to address an issue like climate. But on top of that, we can also see a fantastic interest that has increased over time, of course, but during the past couple of years, yeah, to a fantastic mm. level, especially from the younger customers. And I think that really mm. pushes companies into a direction. So even mm. if you don't mm. have that insight, you yeah, <laughs> ultimately yeah. will because you yeah. are forced to. I mean, I think there is a new type of consumerism that is coming. And mm. either you surf on that wave or you are just fallen underneath mm. it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's towards the consumer wave, it's uh, the consumer votes with their wallet. So as long as, as soon as the bigger companies start feeling it in the wallet, then that's when change will be brought about. Anyhow, what you were talking about with uh, with Greenpeace, I was speaking to my my two boys actually earlier today, and we have a project together with the UNHCR. It's like a little skateboard park thing, but we were, we were talking about um, refugees, and I was explaining. The, I was explaining to them what refugees were, 
and you know, the funny thing was they weren't even really care. They really didn't think about the refugees. They didn't really think about the uh, the bad thing about war. But what they asked me was like, well, Dad, like dropping bombs, like that's not good for the environment. You know. Yeah. So anyhow, maybe that's one way to get some action that you'd start uh, suing governments for destruction of the planet with. Uh, Bombs and guns, whatever. Very good idea. Mm -hmm. Very good idea, but yeah. also I think the like, yeah. Sorry, well, Terry. Better, <laughs> yeah, 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 good yeah. one. <laughs> Terry, you were saying. You were saying. No, but the thing is, like, uh, <laughs> we all have like this double act, you know. Like, I can be pro clean living at the mm. same time I use my airplanes. Mm. Uh, you're saying like uh, we should, you know, penalty you people who do nature crimes and nature mm -hmm. frauds. And for example, when the Olympics come, Olympics are the biggest nature crimes, and I think FIFA come. FIFA is probably bigger, but like IOC is right there. <laughs> and uh, but everybody watch the Olympics, or they go there, or they support it. You know, so like for example, the, the prince in Norway, one one day is in Africa doing uh, humans rights things, and the next day he's in Geneva having dinner with the IOC members and supporting the IOC. Mm. That is just trashing taxpayers' money and nature all over the world. So there's all these two faces all along, you know? So it's like, I have to agree with uh, him when, like, you have to have those gnarly penalties. You have to be... Because uh, I live in a neighborhood where we share trash cans with six, seven houses, and you can see that a lot of people don't do the recycling because we have green bags and, and blue bags and the paper bags. And so... It takes time to recycle, and you do it, and then the neighbor don't do it. Yeah. And what's the motivation for that, you know? Like, there's no penalties for not doing it. So it's like, you have to be way more hardcore if, like, you can just be, I'll just be negative about, about the whole system till somebody just, you know, put the hammer down. But do you think it's effective <laughs> that the kids of the younger generations now, they're uh, doing the school strikes and they're asking all those questions to the parents and the older generation? Do you think that is... Uh, a good, uh, I mean, is it, is it working? Is it, it working better than anything else? Sure, it helps, yeah. but it, you have, they need help from the grown-ups because they're making the decisions, you know? You know but like there a is baby, something baby about that say, your kids like, are you saying, you? why didn't you do anything? Yeah, yes, why? They're, po they're pointing at yeah. something. You, ca you cannot uh, yeah. escape from that. For you cannot escape from the questions. But how mm. uh, d does it make you act on it? Does it make you act that there's kids pointing at you saying, why have you uh, been doing this all along and didn't mm. do anything? Anna? Well, I mean, from, from a company perspective, I mean, we've been working with sustainability for 20 years. And I mean, the, as, as you said, I mean, this is not a new problem. The climate and also environmental concerns have been there for many, many years. But of course, uh, now seeing an even bigger part of consumers, and especially the younger generation, being so openly uh, yeah, active about it. I think it, it definitely helps, and I think it, it really shows that I mean they are the future. This is what they want, uh, and of course to be relevant, then I mean we simply have to go in that direction. We have a question here, Amanda. Uh, I would like to. I was thinking about what Jonas said uh, mm. before, and uh, something that you said another day about democracy and how to include youth in a democratic process, and. Um, I was just wondering like, what you think, what we can do. We've been talking about maybe a youth uh, council that is under the parliament that is allowed to like, ha add pro uh, proposals mm -hmm. to the government, something like that. Or what do you think that we can do to include the youth uh, perspective on these questions? That's a super good uh, suggestion, I think. Because what, like, when you... You, you go in, in the, the college or the gymnasium, you know, you're like 16 to 19. You, you have these two years, or maybe even in the ninth grade, you're 15, and clever and smart and, and not listening to that group, and they cannot still vote, but they have a lot of good ideas. Your brain's sharp. So that's a, that's a totally good idea. Yeah, that's but a totally good idea. But I'm also thinking, idea. how can we make the kids parents listen. That is what I'm thinking all along. It's like, mm. how can we, you know, it's, it's kind of like asking how, how will the kids make me listen, but it's, it's totally difficult to put it on yourself. If you see uh, the parents as a big generation, 
how can the kids make the parents listen to them and take action? But, it, but isn't it like this? You, get, you become a parent and uh, you're a grown up, you're an adult, and uh, you think you have found this is me. You know, and then you have kids and they are growing up to kind of try to get away from you because they will in the end, they will move out around 20, right? So if I don't follow my kids and try, I have to rethink about what parenthood is all the time to, to be able to have my kids as people I can uh, hang out with when they are grown up. You know, if I, if I don't listen to the chi my children and to rethink maybe be just because my mother and grandmother said this and sometimes you can hear, no, you can't do that. Like it just, it's like, it just, it just comes from some DNA, you know, D or do I really think so? I have to rethink what but is right and wrong. And of course, I mean, that is, it's, it, I mean, the, the most uh, terrible situation now with Brexit, when you, you talk to young people in England and, and there's a generation war because there's so many of the older generation, they want Brexit and the young kids that are included in Europe and they say, what? You're soon going to die. I'm going to live with this. And uh, I mean, they shouldn't be able to vote over some certain age, but maybe. There's a suggestion that they should actually lower the voting age for Brexit or in the yes, recent, which I think would have been fantastic. Because it's, it's ridiculous. They are not going to mm. live with this. Mm. It's the young people. And it's also climate. The young people today, they should be able to have, to have their voice heard. Uh, but they are in through this, but uh, more frequently. So we should exclude old people for, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, taking any action and just oh, exclude them. Can I them be say with a little more time, like <laughs> at 70? Can we say 70? <laughs> 70, we can say. We have a question down here. Uh, so hi, yeah, I think my question uh, relates to the part about like that youth, they want truth for more like foremost and also like they want people to be honest when it comes to a climate question and then we want to see systems change and then we're talking about this consumers per perspective and we're saying like yeah uh, consumers are driving change in the industry but for example the H&M group they're part of a fast fashion industry which you have said is dirty of course you're not like denying that but then again you're saying that they're driving these sustainability changes and I mean, I was reading, for example, the um, sustainability report that H&M &M Group released last year. And for example, I think there's such misinformation for consumers and we're saying customers should drive the change, but they're so misinformed. Because for example, you're saying, yeah, we use recycled or sustainably sourced materials in like 56 or 57% uh, in the garments we have. But then only 1.4% like of that is recycled material. And I was going, like I posted this on social media and it's like really informed youth that wrote to me and were like, we had no clue about this and so forth. So I think it's, I don't know how you see about that, that we're saying yes, uh, customers and the youth should drive the change, but they're so misinformed in so many ways. Is so H&M uh, group, uh, group mm. uh, ready for that uh, transparency? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have nothing to hide in that sense. I think there's two things to it. I mean, one is the system change that needs to happen. And I mean, that goes, uh, that is something that companies and governments need to do together. And I think moving into a circular economy, a whole new type of systems means connecting dots that have today only worked in isolation. So it's really a whole new infrastructure and system needs to be set, not within one country, but across the globe. That is a massive undertaking that is taking time. The commitment that we have to have only sustainable resource recycled materials by 2030, I mean, that is, it may sound like it's easy, it is super difficult. And when it comes to actually recycled materials today, there are a lot of limitations, which means that we can't get up to a bigger shed than where we are today because there's not uh, technology available. But give it a few years, a lot of the things that we are seeing now on lab scale uh, and on pilot scale, we'll be able to grow bigger. And then we can, of course, mainstream recycled materials to a much larger extent. I think like within environmentalism, what you're supposed to do, like recycle is like the last option. What you should do is reduce and you should reuse. 
But then the concept is we have to change industry at its fundamentalism that we can't have this process where we're told to buy and buy more. Because even then within the H&M group, for example at Arkit, you're telling people come in with recycled materials and we'll give you 10% a discount on your next purchase. But mm. that's just telling us to buy even more. So that's the thing, I want companies to actually take full responsibility within this process of systems change. Well, I mean, I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I mean, if you read the full report, you know that recycling is not the only thing that we see as an answer. I mean, we, of course, want to work all the way from design to production materials, how the customer uses, and of course, making sure that, it's, that every clothes is used as long as possible before going into recycling. I mean, the solutions are not fully there yet, but we're exploring a lot of different things. We have tried out rental, we're doing re-commerce, uh, looking into take care options. I mean, we are really trying to to go towards a circular system. You don't do that overnight. Uh, are but you ready to produce less and maybe not advertise that much? Absolutely, and as I much? said, I mean, we are also fully aware of the planet's boundaries. It's not that we live in a different world than where you guys are. Uh, and I mean, if we want to exist in 2030, we need to change this. And that's the kind of journey we want to embark on. Uh, but that is not something that you do overnight. And I think that's also why we want to use our size and scale to try to paint up this kind of system we want to have. But I mean, I know that you think that we are super big. We're 2% of the industry. So in order to change something, the other nine the eight needs to be there as well. Um, so I mean, yeah, there's, there's, I can I can talk about this for a few more hours, but <laughs> I will not. But uh, I mean, I totally hear what you're saying. But I think that there's we are doing a lot, but um, more needs to be done. But I, I, we don't have that much time left. So I would like to ask you, uh, all of you, but I'll start with you, Anna. If you if you uh, would give some advice for young activists to be heard. Uh, what do you think you should do if you're a young person and you want to be heard and want to do something, uh, be a climate activist? Where, where should you start? Write the prime, prime minister <laughs> or, or should I write minister. a letter to H&M Group to take more action? Yeah, but I, I do actually think, I mean, th there is a system change that is needed and it comes a lot from both the political and the business level. but you should not underestimate the consumer power and the collective uh, mobilization of many small actions. So, I mean, I, I think that whenever there is something that you want to address and you want to make yourself heard, I mean, take that action, write an email, go on Facebook, do whatever, because I can say from a, being in a big company, that makes a difference. I mean, we know where we need to go regardless of that, but actually having that extra pressure and interest from consumers, it really helps in the decisions that we are making. So no action is too small. Okay, and what is the best way, Facebook or email? Email seems so harmless. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling that if I send an email to anyone, uh, no yeah, one go, would read it. Go or into the stores, or I mean, mm. and, and that is not just... Buying products is okay. not so harmless, that works. Okay, <laughs> would that work? You know, mm. to say that we're not going to buy before you do this. Yeah, but, but of course, then we go into a bigger discussion mm. because if we completely stop all terms of consumption, then we will not have any jobs, for example, and we will have a completely well, different. different jobs. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, yeah, so no, I, I think I think there's it. a question regarding <laughs> like buying because I don't think. I mean, we just need to reinvent the way we think around consumption and production and do the completely different. Uh, but of course, we know that we cannot keep the system that we have today. Tell you what is your best advice for young people that want to be Ooh, heard? But, uh, that's it's so hard, you know. It's so much info to process. There's so many angles of like what's sustainability, you know. Like we're just thinking when I saw a program with the really really experts that was uh, interview in the 1980s, predicting 30 years ahead, and all the re new interviews in that program, they were just like, yeah, don't worry about climate change. It's not going to wipe out the, the the people. It's all the chemicals that we're exposed to. In the, in the food, in our clothing, what we're sitting on, that's going to wipe out the, the humans <laughs> before the climate change. That's what they were saying in that program. You okay. know? So it's in like, the 80s. You know, yeah. like obviously the system doesn't work for how many people we are in the world, you know, and you, know, you have to be a little more drastic, you know? So uh, I don't know, don't get more kids, you know? Best advice? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <No>. Ouch. <laughs> okay. Parenthood. Okay. Uh, he, yeah. And, oh, um, I'm just going to uh, uh, also ask Lena this. Lena, uh, what is your best advice for young people if they want to be heard? Yeah. 
or do I something? I mean, it's very fun to live, right? I mm. don't uh, think we're going to look at it in the future as we're going down, we're going to all die in a couple of generations and that's over, so don't, don't care. I think, that, I think that my advice is to check the source of information because today it's, it's very hard. It's like this climate change is like some kind of opinion. It's not an opinion what's happening, it's facts. But I mean, we, we, and so many people are misled by mis, uh, you know, with, with lies. Mm. So, so uh, the thing to, to, to get yourself aware, get yourself awareness and, and see who is talking and why. I think we have a question from behind first, I'm sorry. Uh, no, actually, we don't. We don't, we don't have... Okay. He has... Here. Okay, you have one. Okay, now. <laughs> Last one. Well, I, I think a big part of the problem is all these, these climate deniers, they don't mm. deny it at all. They just think it's too late. And they're going to have their kicks before the whole shit house goes up in flames. <laughs> so it's yeah. more politically correct to just say, no, I don't believe in it, than to actually say, mm. you know, I'm it's Donald Trump, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, Thank but these people, though, that say it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, yeah. crap that they don't be even believe it. It's yeah. a lot of people that well, says that, too. Yeah, a lot of yeah. people, they just don't care. Mm. Yeah. Thank you all for showing up today, and let's <clears> give <throat> a big round of applause for our panel today. Thank you so much, Talia, Anna, and Lena. Thank you so much. And uh, I will say that please stay put. We say thank you to you, and we are going to change our panel into the next panel, so thank you very much. Thank you. Tuck. And uh, I will uh, try to remind those of you who, who uh, follow us here, that please, uh, social media, react, comment, say things, do things, and Nordic Climate Action is uh, the hashtag that you're supposed to use. And also I want to remind you about so nice who you. is behind all of this. Uh, actually, the Nordic Climate Weeks is a project brought to you by the Nordic Council of Ministers. We are here in Stockholm and we are in Madrid during two whole weeks. This is day six of the two, two weeks and uh, we will be here as long as the COP conference goes on in, uh, in Madrid. And we follow the conference very closely by daily briefings from Madrid. You have the opportunity to ask questions if you, if you want to and if you are interested. And we will give you all the answers that we can. This week it has been mostly about uh, uh, people who are not in power themselves. Next week, as you know, at the conference, uh, ministers from governments all over the world uh, will be uh, in place in Madrid and they will give you answers for all the questions that you can think of in our, uh, on our stage in, in Madrid. Right now we are about to, uh, to uh, change the scenery a little bit here, or not the scenery, but the people on the scene. We will get, uh, get a, new, uh, a new panel in place. We have uh, five young key listeners who for one week have been listening to what we say and following uh, all the discussions. And uh, very shortly we'll hear what they think about what has been done and said so far during this week. And we, uh, uh, we just let them enter the scene here. Here they come, all of them. Five young people who sit down in front of you. And uh, and start very briefly. Uh, you will you will start talking uh, as soon as uh, everybody is ready. Sarah is ready. So I'm saying uh, once again, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you five. Um, I will just make people sit down and walk. Okay. Let's just start. We are the first generation to feel the sting of climate change, and we are the last generation that can do something about it. This is what uh, President Obama tweeted in 2014, and uh, this is a very famous tweet, and maybe, yeah, even true, even more true now. Welcome to this Nordic talk. 
we, uh, we have gathered here a special group of uh, people to give you an honest review of the prospects of the COP25 climate negotiations in Madrid. Let us you five guys. Welcome. Let's give them a big applause for showing up today. Thank you. Um, let's start from one end. Amanda, welcome to you. Will you please uh, introduce yourself and, and also tell me the specific moment that made you a climate activist? Yes, I will. So it's the, no, it yeah. sounds, sounds perfect. Uh, so my name is Amanda Bonneke. Uh, I'm 26 years old and I work as a quality and environmental leader in the construction industry. Uh, I think the, the moment I really sparked my climate activism was uh, overshoot day in uh, 2006. And I don't know if you heard about overshoot day, everyone, but it's, um, you can kind of see it as a budget for the whole year, but your money ends, uh, uh, runs out in July. And the rest of the year, you need to borrow money from your family, your friends, and all the future generations. And that's exactly how it works, but with the natural resources. Thank you. Alex? Yeah. Welcome uh, to you. Will you also introduce yourself and, and, and tell me this specific moment when you it became a climate activist? Sure. Um, that's amazing, um, actually, sitting here. Um, I'm, I'm, I must say that I'm, I'm Alex, come from Norway, I'm from Talmark as well. They're magnificent seeing such a representation here in uh, Stockholm. Um, and actually, I'm kind of, I got involved because of my family. So, um, yeah, it's been um, sort of uh, knowledge that actually been provided by my father and grandfather, and both actually been into the environment technologies. Um, so it's sort of, um, my ambience and surroundings that actually provide me with inspiration and motivation to work for this um, for this field of studies. Um, yeah, I'm back in Norway, coming to the political life, I contributed to work of the Green Party and got involved in the many international projects all around Europe within the Green family. Um, apart from that, here I represent the Nordic Youth Council. Uh, we also got involved through the um, quote they actually distributed for the brains of Nordics. Yeah, amazing to be here. Do you remember like a specific moment, even though you, you said your dad and your granddad uh, inspired you, is there a specific moment you remember where you really thought, okay, I, I also have to do something? Um, well, actually, I think this is something that's been accumulating over the um, quite few years. And then it's... Um, you know, there is nothing like particular actually that stroke a dump into my heart, but it's like rather maybe being mature and like realizing the uh, crucial effect and like outcomes of the um, political activities all around the world. I just like, you know, I just woke up. So it was a bit like sort of awakening uh, with respect to the knowledge that I gained, um, as I said previously. Okay, thank you. Welcome to you too, Jonas. Uh, welcome to you. Thank Would you also introduce yourself and and tell us uh, when did you spark? Hello, everybody. My name is Jonas. I'm from Denmark, and I'm a chairman of Regeneration 2030. The moment that sparked for me was back when I was 14, so that's 14 years ago, when my uh, grandfather told me about the climate crisis. Uh, I was there visiting with my little brother. Shout out to him if he's watching. Mm -hmm. um, and basically I was watching down the beach uh, with my grandfather and he told me about climate change or the climate crisis as it's supposed to be called if you are proper. And he basically said all the emergencies and all the terrible uh, possible happenings that could, that could uh, you know, be to our world. And he basically said, yeah, so I mean, Denmark could be underwater in so many years and the same with Netherlands and the migrants will come uh, because of the climate crisis and we don't have food enough and also the sun is going to, the temperature is going to change and the pole is going to melt, it's terrible. And I said, wow, okay, that's a, poof, that's a, that's a story. Yeah, let's, let's go eat some lunch, right? <laughs> so that was the, 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 the whole kick of it. And since then, I was, I was one of those few, the few lucky, um, lucky ones that was, sparked by this and it gave me a kick and a, and a sense of purpose at a quite young age. Currently in Denmark we have a lot of, of, of youth being uh, hit with you know, climate angst uh, and they are actually you know, homesick from school because they are fearful of the future. 
That's because well, it's evolving and it is the continuous story of, of the terrible uh, consequences with no possible solutions uh, around the corner. So I guess you know it's a it's a way to react and to everybody uh, young in the audience and in Madrid and watching back home. There's you know of course there's hope, but the power of youth is so magnificent you have no idea. So please join us. Good, thank you, Jonah. Uh, welcome to you too. Would you also introduce yourself and let us know? when you became a climate activist. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Jona. I'm the student council president of the University of Iceland. And uh, my story is a bit different. Um, I knew about the climate crisis and global warming in school, but it was stated as a fact. It was stated as something that is about to happen and it will happen. And thank you very much. Goodbye. So that was the way I was introduced to it uh, in the fir at the beginning, but then uh, once I became older and more aware, I realized there's something to be done about it. And uh, in university, actually, through my peers, I got to know a movement within the university that emphasized environmental issues. And I started getting involved with that. And that's maybe the moment where I started to do something actively, becoming this activism that it is today. And in February, the Student Council actually started with, in co cooperation with other organizations to um, organize the climate strikes in Iceland. And that's what I've been doing so far this year. And so it was a gradual awakening for me. And yeah, that's what I'm doing through the Student Council. And we've declared an emergency on the climate crisis and we're demanding that the government do something as well. So this is the journey that I'm on. Thank you. Welcome to you two also, Carolina. Thank you. Um, would you also introduce yourself and let us know when you became a climate activist? Yes. Uh, so my name is Carolina Long. Uh, I'm 25 years old. I'm a law student, born and raised in Helsinki. Um, I've had a hard time identifying myself as a climate activist. Um, I'm born um, and raised in, in Finland of course, and in Finland, I think we have a very close uh, relation to the nature, uh, but that's something we take for granted. Um, but uh, I was going to this uh, high school uh, with a speciali specialization in, in ecology, and I think that really changed my view on these questions. But I'm here today, actually, uh, together uh, with the Nordic uh, Advisory Board on Youth Involvement in the UN Biodiversity Negotiations. Um, so I was actually quite shocked about the link between climate change uh, and loss of biological diversity. And I think that really changed everything for me. Do, do you remember like, a specific moment where you realized that? Yeah, actually, I have a moment like that. Um, I was I was in Copenhagen, um, and uh, I had this like news feed on my cell phone, um, and there was this New York Times uh, news report on like one million species going extinct, uh, and I think that was a really like a alarm bell in this matter. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would also, uh, I, I've asked you to, because uh, you've been uh, like following the, the COP25 in Madrid and f from here and everywhere, but not in Madrid. And, and we asked you to like make an honest review of it, what you've uh, observed so far. And uh, I really, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, but I also would like to ask you uh, if you have like a thing that you are, that is like <laughs> the the thing that you you've done so far that you I don't know for yourself or for someone else where you really like put a foot down and said this this is uh, this is what I'm gonna do or this is like something that is really important to me. Can anyone think of that? Yeah, yeah Amanda. Yeah, I think um, uh, when I became a vegetarian when I was uh, 12, like my family did not approve. <laughs> and that was uh, very emotional. And it, like you already have so much emotions in, in that age, but I was so set that I was gonna become a vegetarian. Uh, Pita had been in my school and had like a seminar about pigs. And I was like, I'm never eating animals again. Uh, and it took some time uh, for them to just adjust with my new uh, uh, food. 
and back then there were like no veggie options in like the food uh, story, which is beans, <laughs> beans and like tomato sauce. That was all <laughs> that I ate back then. Uh, but I think one moment that I was really proud of happened just a couple of years ago. And uh, that was when my father cooked uh, a vegan meal for me without me even like saying anything. He just did it. Oh, that's nice. Do, do any of you other also have like a thing that you did, but you really like, yeah? yeah? I really relate Leona? to that actually. And mm -hmm. it, it just was a recent event in my family um, where we had been talking about having less meat, less meat, let's have less meat. And then they were like, well, if you just want less meat, then you cook yourself. And I'm like, oh, well, okay. But with the, the student council presidency comes a hefty work day, so I just ha don't have much time for cooking. But I eventually said, well, you don't have to worry about me for dinner anymore then. So that's, that's it. But then it was like, oh, so we're there. And they changed, and now there are vegan meals in the home. So that's obviously putting your foot down in your closest environment. But I also, like, when organizing the first global climate strike that I participated in, where we had like this walk and everything, it was not just coming together, it was, there were uh, activities within the strike. That was also a really big moment for me. And it really, um, taking part in that inspired myself, if I could say that, it, it encouraged me to do more because I realized, okay, I can do this and bring all these people together and then I'm gonna do more and there's hope. So I think activism also can be like a tool for people who are concerned to deal with it. So it, it can be a release and, and a sense of hope when you do something like that for yourself. That's so nice. Thank you. Jonas? Yeah, I would like to say something about a continuous journey because for me there's been so many small events where I was happy to, I was able to do something or it has brought change. Uh, mostly it was derived from a previous feeling of you know, lack of either competence from me or my peers or above my peers. And then I said, well, you know, I'll do it then. And we just had a panel earlier, I don't know many who watched it, where we had a, a, a generation above us, I think it's the polite term, uh, where they talked about uh, how you engage youth. And you're like, well, sure. You only had like 40, 50 years to do so yourself, but now it's <laughs> fine. So I mean, this, the, 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 uh, the power to do, as I said in my introduction, the power to do something as youth is quite magnificent. It's not to be un underestimated. Now we are talking a lot about Greta Thunberg, and that's of course very, very nice, but it, it comes at a curious time where suddenly a 15-year-old from Sweden, uh, I mean, almost gets uh, like some kind of demigod status in the world of politics. Everybody wants to get a photo of her if you are a politician, which I guess is nice, but I mean, is, it, is, she, is she a token or has it actually brought real change? And, you know, it, it, it comes from, you can see in the Brundtland report from 1987, that wasn't enough for politicians of that generation. The first COP in 1992 wasn't enough. 1995 COP wasn't enough. The 1997 Kyoto Protocol wasn't enough. Only the EU is still following that protocol. The 2009 catastrophic uh, COP15 uh, in Denmark wasn't enough to like, okay, maybe we should do this seriously. 2015 Paris Agreement, that's still not enough. 2015 it's a G agenda, it's not enough. Greta Thunberg is enough in 2016. I have my severe doubts that it's, that it's enough. Tears from a kid, come on. Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it, it's, it's a powerful tool, right? Mm. But I mean, how much is it, is it uh, because of the kid? How much of, is, of it is because of, of what she says? And if it's because of youth, which I think it is, that's good for us, because we are willing to do that, what they don't want to do. And like, well, it wasn't enough for the last 30, 40 years, but I mean, you're willing, welcome to hand us the keys to the parliament and your corporations, and we'll, we'll do it for you. But I asked you if you had like a personal thing that yes, you did. Yes, but I mean, that's, you, that's okay. exactly the thing. That's, okay. it's, it's more of a belonging to a dem uh, demographic that okay. can, can continue to do okay. change. I okay. mean, that's, that's a... Alex, do you have also um, a thing you did? Not for like reinforcement on oh. this part, but just like bringing a bit of uh, kind of my personal uh, story, just like, uh, yeah, shedding the light into what happened like with me um, in terms of this uh, the environmental crisis and like the issues that we're actually striving with. Um, you know, like, um, I belong to the environment that is, like, really into vehicles. And, like, coming back to Norway, when you got to cross the huge distances, then, uh, you know, like, the only kind of reasonable choice would have been, like, if you go for a bouncing car or, like, diesel car. And that would be, like, a common sense. But, like, back in the days when, you know, there's mind-blowing technologies of electrical cars and any other electrical vehicles actually pop up, I, like, everybody was so skeptical, you know, they were just, like, banning the line and just telling, like, you know, that's, that's quite good in terms of toys, 
but in the real implementation, it won't really work out because it's just meaningless. But you know, there is something that's really kind of twisted out inside of me, and I, I would like to try to really state my um, family and surroundings that, that that would be the only logical solution. And right now, 2019, no way is the world's second largest market of electrical vehicles. So it's all real. You know, they say we're actually made of our dreams. So I think we. Um, we can't really like take for granted um, of our like countries, and also I think like if there is some technology that actually can change the world, uh, you just got to believe in that. And then if you like push and pursue that, uh, who knows? Maybe that would be like a golden key to open the door. Kalina, do you do you have like a special thing that you did where you put your foot down or like made a real concrete statement? I think it's more of like an ongoing pro process mm -hmm. and like keep doing the work mm -hmm. and keep up with it. And I think also that the um, youth climate movements give many people a sense of community that they might have lacked before and that shouldn't be underestimated either in like further motivating people to keep up with the climate work. Thank you. So now we want to hear your honest reviews on the COP25. Uh, I, I've, uh, yeah. Uh, who wants to start? Jonas, great. Um. And also, of course, if you have any questions, uh, uh, you just raise your hand and we will pass the mic around. Right? Yeah. Uh, so the COP25 was um, a bit like COP24 and COP4 and COP8 and COP15 in the sense that there's been a lot of, a lot of talk and uh, we'll see during the months after the COP whether or not, or not that, uh, that those words bear any weight or any fruit. Um, the main focus so far has been about the Paris Agreement, even though that's four years ago. Uh, the next week is the most exciting week in the sense that that's where the ministers actually join for the discussion. So the wheels of power to discuss it. Again, we'll see if that has any fruit because it's actually only seven days they're supposed to discuss the solution of the salvation of the entire globe. But I guess we can hope that they will solve it within a week. Uh, if not, uh, the debate is continued. But this particular COP has been, you know, basically like, like the others. And the main thing that I see is that we have a lot of politicians. It's changed every year. We have new world leaders joining every year because of, of course, elections in domestic countries and all that. So it's a, it's a new board in this, uh, every single time. But the continuous discussion is who will be the front runner? Because if you're the front runner, as like the H&M um, uh, sustainability officer said before, you lose out immediately. Because it is, you have to turn the knobs, you have to turn down your growth a bit, turn up against your, your sacrifice a bit to be the, the lead uh, in the environmental department. And it also comes with some sacrifices. So, you know, you need the politicians to be brave and embrace this, this, uh, this sacrifice. And I don't see that happening immediately unless we have this more federal uh, solutions like through the EU or through the states or through some kind of Eastern China where parts of the world decide, well, we're going to take this burden together, which is, is what the Nordic uh, can do and what we've been discussed here in Stockholm this week. So it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. And I don't know, you've talked about it uh, before, but it's, it's more of a, we need our politicians to remember that their job is secured by our uh, power to vote them in office. Uh, we are essentially their bosses, even though we sit here, uh, and we want them to do their job. If not, we'll fire them and find, find something new. Uh, but, you know, even the new is continuing the old debate, so I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical, but I'm still a bit optimistic, yeah. Did you have a comment, Carolina? Yeah, yeah? yeah actually, uh, I've been seeing like this like evil circle between like international climate negotiations and the climate policies happening in the countries. Because always when you have the like national debate, for example, in Finland, we've been de debating a lot about having taxes on flights. Um, so in Finland, we say, no, we can't have the tax on flight because we will lose in international competition to other countries, then we, like the companies will just move to another countries like they do with other taxes. Um, but then on the other hand, then we come to this COP, this uh, huge climate negotiations, and the, the topic isn't discussed at all, and it's not on the agenda. Uh, so it's this evil like circle where you don't get anywhere. Um, and, and I was also watching Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General um, of the United Nations, in his opening speech, and he was talking about this like lack of political will uh, for the COP. Um, and he was speaking about that 
uh, a week before the ministers even arrived. I don't know, political will is not a force of nature. Political will is something coming from the politicians and from us as the people. Uh, so I was a bit surprised about his statement. Uh, but, but what about Jonas? I just have to ask you: uh, did, did you expect this to be just another cop? Did you, did, oh, so you didn't expect anything else? You didn't expect not really. There was a question on, on Monday where we mm. asked, "What are your expectations?" Mm. I said, "I'd rather ha say what my hopes are because my yeah. expectations are actually quite pessimistic." <laughs> okay, uh, and that's just based on pure experience. Uh, okay. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm afraid so. I, but you I'll, hope for what? You hope, I hope for, what? for actually change. I hope, I hope to to for the words they've, they, they've uttered throughout the years to bear any weight in the end. Uh, our own government in Denmark just passed their climate law yesterday after being in government for four months. So, I mean, and now they can discuss the COP even though they've been there for a week. I don't know what they've done there for a week because they had no leverage through it. We have, we have no ambitions ourselves, but I mean, so we'll see. It's, it's, it's just, uh, yeah, it's the same so, story. So what are you hoping for the next week then? Next week? Yeah. Well, I hope for the at least for the Danes because now they have a, uh, they are high on this uh, on this uh, new yeah. law they are they are adding. Yeah. So we are hoping that they will actually implement it and ask to, to join in the EU as well because throughout those the bigger corporations, uh, I mean corporations of politician political will, we can actually make some severe changes. So I'm hoping that there will be some front runners to say. Okay, n we have a plan. Actually, we've had a plan since 2015. Uh, so maybe we should act upon it and we should negotiate uh, who will lose out. We've always already have quotas of refugees for the, for the UN, where everybody loses a bit when they're taking refugees, if that's how you view it, which most uh, countries do. But you share the burden. So we could do that as well, because if you can make quotas that you are legally bound to follow, we should be able to do that as well. So I think, I think that that's, that's where, the, you know, the, the the medal is to be won, is to be, uh, to be a front one and say we will be the first one to take it. We'll okay. be the first movers. And I'm hopeful that that will happen, but I'm... I'm, I'm one, is, it, is there one specific decision that you're hoping for? That's difficult because the UN has no power of the legislation, so it's, it's, uh, the decisions are always just agreements and promises. Okay. So I'm actually hoping that uh, we, our decisions we made in for European member states will go back to the, to the Commission and the Parliament to say, Ursula von der Leyen, you're just taking your job the 1st of December, this is what we decide as EU member states at the COP, please implement them, that's what you want, that's what we want, and then we can be the front movers and we can push the agenda in the entire world. That's my hope. Jonah, you were, yeah. Yeah, uh, so my perspective, and I share this perspective that this is, in a sense, the same COP as, as had, had been held before, but that's especially when listening to uh, politicians. When I've been listening to scientists and following the events where there are actually scientists, uh, I feel like it's different because we heard from one person uh, yesterday who was the co-author of the Declaration of an Emergency that 11,000 scientists uh, signed on to just this November. So. And getting 11,000 scientists to agree on something is an achievement by itself. So that's, that's big, and we're talking about that, so that's different. Also, uh, Martin Frick, the Senior Director of Policy, I believe he is, he actually said we have failed because this is the 25th COP and emissions are still rising. So I feel like the people who are not directly politicians are speaking in a different way, and I think that's because of the public pressure that's been brought on because of the climate strikes. So I'm... I'm like optimistic in that way because the people who are simply there to do the job and simply there uh, as scientists and don't, aren't stakeholders, I feel like they realize what's going on. But I, I share the view on other debates that I've been watching uh, from Jonas. And around the flight taxation and emissions, I mean, Article 6 is one of the big questions in this COP, which is around... Uh, a, cooperative uh, carbon market. Mm. So uh, that's a question that they're still trying to resolve, that they need to resolve by next year if they want to Im implement the Paris Agreement. So I feel, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I agree with both, but yet have kind of a different view, I think, from, from my perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, Amanda, I think you had your hand yeah. up before, yeah. Yes, I have, uh, um, no, and I had some comments on the previous uh, hmm. speakers, but um, let's talk about my COP uh, uh, yeah, yeah, what I thought about the meeting so far. And I think my views are pretty different from all the others. But I've been following, since I'm from a business uh, perspective, I've been following more the companies, all, 
like, and trying to translate what Article 6 would mean for my industry. And um, it's basically called an NDC. It's like a climate action plan. They had that discussion yesterday. And so then a lot of companies got invited to help hold presentations at COP. And um, it was a really very nice contribution that uh, companies and young people, uh, like we as key listeners, are invited to participate in all this big meeting. Um, so that, that was really nice. But um, the NDC for my industry, it's going to be like a real action plan. Like now, this COP, I think, for me, has been very different than from the others. Since the Paris Agreement, we've been planning a lot of how to implement the Paris Agreement. But this is the first COP where we actually try to implement it for real. And like, how are we going to do this? <laughs> and we're going to do it with the action plans. So we have gotten goals for every six months, which we must achieve. Like, how many machines are we going to convert to fossil free? Are we going to convert to bio hydro uh, fluids? Like, stuff like that. So, we have to make a switch now, otherwise, there will be huge taxes on our projects. You're optimistic, I'm sensing. What? You're optimistic about the things that you've seen or heard and listened to? I you, think, you I think, think it's going different. No, I mean, this, this is what, like, what's happening mm. right now in my industry. Like, I work after those climate plants every day. So I feel like there is uh, definite, definitely a will from companies and businesses, like we are way ahead sometimes, the political will. And often in my job, there is a gap in dialogue between the uh, government and like the companies. The companies want to do so, so much, but they are regulated in a way that they can't do it. Uh, but then I also, uh, I had a comment for you, uh, Alex. Because I realized that you grew up like in a family where you have like a lot of climate engagement in your family, and I thought that was really nice because I, I was a bit jealous when you talked about that <laughs> because I haven't gotten that much support like from uh, home, mm -hmm. especially not from um, my grandpa and my grandma. Uh, I think they stopped talking to me when I was like 14 because I became an environmentalist then. Is that true? Yes. Are they still not talking to you? No. Wow, Amanda, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, but but then it's like um, that kind of ignited a spark in me as well. Like I'm gonna prove you guys that I can work with this, and this is a real job, and don't uh, uh, like never let anyone else try to push you down and just follow your dreams. Uh, yes, I nice. said. You you guys mm. also had? Do you have comments on what Amanda s just said or? Yeah, uh, uh, she, she was talking a lot about implementation, and implementation is also a theme that I've tried to bring up during this week. Because um, it's, of course, one thing to have an agreement, but another thing to fulfill it. Um, and I think that's the big problem, uh, that the Paris Agreement, for example, ha ha haven't been uh, fulfilled um, by any country, as far as I know. Um, so that's the huge issue we are dealing with. And, and another thing is that uh, implementation um, sometimes get confused with individual action. Uh, and I was watching Greta Thunberg when she got off the boat in Portugal. Um, and she was talking about her getting off the boat and how ridiculous it was that she was taking a sailboat uh, over, the, like, over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and I think that's the challenge that we all, all are facing. Uh, that it is almost impossible to live a sustainable lifestyle uh, in the world order we live in today as an individual. Jonna, you also had a comment for Amanda? Yeah, because mm. she was talking about uh, action and how that uh, and, and, um, impacts her and her daily life. And the event that spoke to me the most and gave me the most hope was on global climate action because there they had pathways for each section, industry, human settlement, transport, and they have, but divided by, uh, there's a timeline and there's uh, actions for different stakeholders and how they do it, and now it's up to them. It's kind of, we are trying to provide you with the solutions. You don't even have to think that much about it. So here it is on a platter, 
So of course you have to do it with some thought, you can't do it mindlessly, mm. but there is action. And I, I, that spoke to me and gave me hope. And that was also from people who are simply doing their jobs. And you know, it's not the politicians, it's the politicians' jobs then and, and the corporations to actually do something in accordance with these pathways that we now have. So they are presented, they're here, published 27th of November at the UN home site. Everybody can see it. So yeah, that gave me hope. You think it's different from the other cops? This, I mean, I pathways? haven't seen something like this because my hope was that we could prioritize action in the broadest sense, that we should make global climate uh, issues the leading issues in all policy making. And there we have some form of that. This is some kind of uh, form of, yes, the, the prioritizing and, and the re-envisioning how we make our policies in individual policy making categories. It's not just, oh, climate change and then everything else. It has to be the leading issue through and through. And this is an example. This is a start. This is something in that regard. Alex, I think it's your turn. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I'm completely with you on the observations. I think that just uh, it's so right. And it actually goes into the, you know, like um, understanding the, the role of the COP, because honestly, just like finding um, activity plan and uh, implement that and also like to prepare the World Society to COP in Glasgow happening next year and just like facilitate for that. Um, but I want just to bring you back to the COP. And I think like what is really fascinating for me, it was actually facts behind it. It was been happening behind the stage, uh, specifically just bringing up the, uh, the reports that actually been revealed on the COP. And um, I just have to underline that, you know, when it, when it comes to those kind of COPs, it's, it's a huge arena for trading carbon emissions because absolutely, I mean, you know, it's just explicitly that somebody is getting money on that, somebody is just selling them and buying them. So it's also a bit of, you know, kind of commercial background in that. But um, reports that have been revealed saying that, you know, we just, we, we got to invest 100 billion dollars just to make something work this year in order to, you know, m kind of prepare ourselves and uh, work consistently on achieving a reducing of 1.5 degrees worldwide. But at the same time, there is a gas oil report that's been revealed, and it's stating that Canada, the US, Norway, and Argentina just invested 1.4 trillion dollars in just uh, you know excavations and developing um, um, new stations and sort of just kind of investing in that business. So it's a bit controversial, and we can't really live with that, because if consistency is not achieved, you know, we can't really move forward. Uh, but besides, there are also like the, the most vulnerable countries that actually been exposed by uh, the global change and warming as actually Japan, Germany, like the hugest leaders of the, um, and in, like the ones that actually have industrial potentials. Um, yeah, so I feel like, you know, like, Next cup needs one more Greta. Said that Jonas, you also had a comment. Yeah. Um, do you know the fable about the uh, the uh, turtle racing the rabbit? Mm -hmm. Where the uh, rabbit starts and then after no, the turtle starts after it has walked one meter. Then the rabbit starts, uh, but when that has walked one meter, then the turtle has walked ten centimeters. So to get to those 10 centimeters, I have to, to then run 10 centimeters, but then the uh, turtle has run one centimeter. So I never catched up, right? It's a, it's a tiny bit the same with the climate thing, because then you can talk about action, and it's very, very true. That's actually as exactly happening. We are doing a lot of, of stuff, but it's based on reports and outsides from the last 10 years, and not the current year, often. So you can say, well, now we've lowered emissions by 15% through the next, next, uh, last three years. Sure, but for three years ago, we said we have to reduce them by 25%. So we are you know, catching up to an agenda we had back in the day. And the climate crisis is fortunately much worse than that. Like, it's much worse than we think. So, but the biggest change, as also to back you up, uh, Alex, the biggest change that I see to propel action way, way faster so we can actually you know, uh, you know, overtake the, uh, the turtle is, to, um, is because of the economic uh, growth potential there is, apparently. We, of course, we can't both have the same amount of growth that we had, and we also meet our, our, our targets. That's, that's just not possible. So it's like, well, what then do we do? Well, the good thing is there's money in the green uh, movement. We see in both India and China and sub-Saharan countries that invest in solar energy because it's cheap. It's just more cheap than fossil fuels. So they are doing what we call leapfrogging. This is just skipping 
technology advancements and they're going straight to the solar and straight to the wind and straight to the biofuel or whatever it is that what is did green. You call, what did you call that? Leapfrogging. Leapfrogging. Yeah. Wow. When you skip a technology or an advancement on, in, in, in capital. So they go straight to it and, and that's only because of the economy. Of course, some of it is also because of sustainability and, and environmental protectionism, but it's mainly of economical reasons. So that's a good thing. If we can go green because of the economy, that's good. It's not happening fast enough, but I mean, it's, it's a spark that can kick us in the right direction much faster. But is the COP25 about that? Is, is that a new thing in this COP? Or? Uh, it's, it's always been of a big, uh, big you know, <laughs> discussion point. Was, oh, we want to do this, but then uh, we have to lower our growth into GDP by like 0.5%. And that's not really what we want because we also want to overtake our neighbor in the economic field. We want to be in that a trade agreement, and we want to be in that trade agreement. And for us to be that, we have to be, have this amount of, of, uh, of growth in our GDP on an annual basis. That's been the biggest you know, stick in the wheel for all the countries. So when we remove that stick and say, well, you can actually still have that almost, and also follow the agendas, then we are starting to see something that works. So what about this COP? What, what is the best thing happening on this COP25, in your opinion? Um, are we saving the planet this time? <laughs> no. no. Uh, we are saving um, uh, some s uh, an increased small percentage of it every single year. Um, maybe we are saving another 5%, or while 6% of, of it is dying, so we are still in a, in a rush. But uh, th the, the biggest thing, actually, uh, if I have to be a bit positive for one, <laughs> is, <laughs> is, is, that, uh, <laughs> is, um, is that we, um, we are talking about the Paris Agreement about implementation of the agreement. Of course, we can't implement it because it's not a, a lot of law, it's not a bill, it's not a regulation in that sense. It's an agreement, but people are talking about it still and sticking to it. And, and that's a positive. So we haven't like backpedaled. Well, one country have backpedaled um, uh, on the first agreement, but I mean, it seems that that is, that is actually accepted as the political norm from now on, at least. Th that's a very positive thing. Alex? Yeah, um, absolutely. And besides, we, we like we don't have to gather 192 countries in order to, you know, kind of achieve global uh, solutions. It's basically quite simple. I mean, like if they just like a camp will be created uh, for Russia, the United States and China, they can actually resolve. They can actually come up with like any any kind of uh, environmental friendly solution just on their own. Um, That's the least possible. I mean, places in the world yeah. to do it. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's basically, uh, you know, like 80% emissions uh, belong to those global giants, which means uh, just like contributing even into um, putting 50% of uh, emissions on the, all the other parties uh, will still result in like 10% on the global scale. Amanda? Yeah, I wanted to share another tendency that I've seen this uh, COP that I haven't seen before at all. And that's, uh, I hear a lot of companies talking about circular economy <laughs> in a much broader way than before. Like even companies as IKEA, H&M, um, but also Rank Sales, a lot of uh, construction companies. Uh, and I think that's so awesome. Like that's really cool that even the biggest uh, companies are trying to take responsibility and shift into a more circular economy. Uh, for construction and demolition, it's mainly about reuse, reusing uh, the materials from the building that we demolish. We don't have to uh, extract sand from our oceans to uh, make concrete. We can just reuse the concrete that we have. Uh, Carlina, you had uh, one last comment, and then we'll take a round of good <coughs> advice for all the listeners and um, viewers. Uh, I was uh, very positive about this event being streamed. Mm -hmm. uh, so that anyone can participate. Uh, I think we should demand more of transparency uh, in the climate negotiations. And I think that's something we haven't talked that much about, the role of the media uh, and also the role of like open government. For example, Jonas was saying that he don't even know what the Danish uh, have they been. Don't they, 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 don't they don't know yeah. what they are negotiating. Uh, be, or like what they base their negotiations on. So I think we should be better to, uh, to demand more um, from that point of view. Okay, we, we don't have, to have that much time, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand now, or else I'll take a, a ask each one of you to uh, give a good advice if there's some listeners uh, of this podcast or viewers on the streaming uh, that 
considering to be more activist, uh, what, what is your best advice to do? What is the best thing that they can do if, you know, say something to the parents or to the teachers? Or what is the best advice, Carolina? I think the first step uh, is, of course, to get informed on the matter. Um, because I think the information is so shocking that people will sort of have this urge to act um, when they read. So, so where is the best place to get the best information? Um, what should we Google? <laughs> uh, you can, of course, follow the COP25 uh, mm -hmm. online. Any, anyone can do it. You can also re read the speeches mm -hmm. online. Uh, but also, I think the IP... CC reports are a good place to start. Thank you. Nona? Yeah, I think um, every little thing can matter. And um, in my country, as well as uh, the event earlier, they talked about um, climate uh, stress. And uh, I think it's important for everyone not to put too much of a burden on themselves, especially the young ones, because this is only so much in your hand. But you can do something, and I feel like, as I sa stated earlier, that activism can both be beneficial because you are a part of a crowd, and I think there are power in numbers. So I joined the movement because I, that was my way of finding something to do about this. But the small steps and the little things matter too, like saying I'm going to be vegan at home, or stop using cars, or uh, taking the bus instead, and so, stuff like that. So the little things matter. But don't push yourself too hard, because then it becomes such a burden that it will absolutely paralyze you. So, yeah, little things, but also movements around you. Because especially in Iceland, there are movements here and there where you can find strength in numbers and be a part of this, of this journey. Thank you. Jonas? That's a very good comment, and I want to you know, build on top of that. It's just the small steps. We all know these people who every single election year say, well, I don't vote because it makes no difference. Well, join the other 80,000 people who say that, and if you do that together and vote, you could actually make a change that you say it don't exist. Of course, it might not seem as much going vegan back home when you have one billion Chinese pumping CO2 out in there like, like it's nothing. Uh, but it's a cultural thing. The climate crisis, of it, one thing, is, is a cultural thing. If we can not just see in this panel, we can hear about personal stories about how you change the people's behavior back home or your friends or your family. Well, then it kickstarts. Then, because then it touches. You all have to, what, what did you say? You, you, if you share a Facebook post 10 times, you hit like 1 million people. I don't know how if that number is even true, but it, there, it's quite it, obvious that the more people you activate, the, the, the bigger the movement get in a very rapid a very rapid speed. So my biggest advice is to say, don't underestimate the small things. And if you want to do big things, good, power to you. But there's no, there's, there's, there's no uh, like, um, shame in just, in just turning off the tap when you brush your teeth. Already there, you think about it. And you can say to others, hey, maybe you should also you know, stop uh, the tap when you brush your teeth. And then that person reads why we do that, and then read all this terrible uh, things and say, okay, maybe I want to do more than just close a tap. Maybe I want to run for office, right? It's just, <laughs> it just, it, it explodes. So make it a talkative thing. Maybe just something that you do because it's what you do. That's what we're good at in, in Scandinavia, at least in the Nordic region, sorry, that we are, we are good at, at, at interchanging the culture quite fast if it's something we agree on collectively because we're a collective group of people. And I think that can be empowered in the rest of the world as well. Yeah. Thank you. Alex? Yeah, right. So for everyone, um, I would say just keep your eye open on um, next week happening uh, in um, in Madrid. Also, the next 14 months is just crucial because that will be like sort of what people what kind of a real outcome of the um, Madrid discussions um, and be and how it's implemented in the real life. And for the youth, I would say that uh, you know keep keep being young. Uh, there is a high probability when you become older that nobody actually listens to you after that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like the history shows an example that in order to achieve something and be excel and stand up, you have to be different. So they are to be different. Thank you. Amanda? Yes. Um, I think um, that we need a shift, actually, in what activism means. For me, being a climate activist is a very negative thing. Like, I, I would never brand myself as an activist. And I think that's because I 
for me, the activist, it's like the environmental person that is the woodpecker, as I, I have a lot of bird references, okay? <laughs> uh, the woodpecker, it's like someone who is always uh, complaining and shaming, like, don't do this, you're doing it wrong, do this instead. And that is the kind of, kind of communication that locks a behavior. So I usually say that we should be like roosters, like doo -doo -doo. every morning we're going to talk about climate change and we're going to have so much fun and you're good at this and this and this. And that's the kind of communication that will um, engage sustainable behavior. So yes, more roosters. Okay, thank you. Thank you all five. Thank you for all your work. You're so nice. And let me say also thank you to Amanda, Alex, Jonas, Jona, and Carolina, and last but not least to Sara. Thank you very much thank for you. being here today and for being so wise. I love that. And to you, I want to say that actually we were very much hoping that five cyclists that started from Oslo on Thursday, that they would have been here with us exactly now. They are some five kilometers from here now, but um, they, which means that they have, a, it's a 600 kilometer long journey. So they have been cycling very, very fast since Thursday, but they're not here yet. So um, if you would have been lucky, you would have met them, but you who are here, if you stay 10 more minutes, you will. So good night and see you tomorrow.